Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers administrative duties, officer discretion, and police authority, and is brought to us by the Columbus Ledger Inquirer's channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. On the night of July 16th, 2022, several officers from the Columbus Police Department in Columbus, Georgia, gathered outside the Muskogee County Jail, awaiting their turn to book suspects that they had apprehended as part of a weekend crime suppression detail coordinated with the Georgia Georgia State Patrol. Prior to conducting the operation, Muskogee County Sheriff Greg Countryman asked the Columbus PD to call off the procedure, citing overcrowding issues within the jailhouse. The Columbus PD ignored Sheriff Countryman's request and pursued the detail anyway. In response, Sheriff Countryman instructed the jail staff to process prisoners in the following priority, Muskogee deputies first, State Patrol officers second, and Columbus police officers third. This resulted in multiple officers from the Columbus PD being being forced to wait outside the jail as suspects captured by the sheriff's department were processed first. The body camera footage begins as Muskogee Deputy Blaine Atkins arrives at the jail with a suspect and cuts in front of Corporal Christopher Snipes from the Columbus PD, who had already been waiting to book his suspect for several minutes. Bear in mind that the text you see throughout this video is from the original upload and not added by this channel. Also, the first few seconds of the footage is blurred for the protection of the citizens involved, but it clears up momentarily. They won't let us in. Ain't that right? Nah, you go in there before us, I'm gonna raise hell. Watch this. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm gonna file I'm gonna file a complaint, a legitimate complaint. Am I with you? That's a mean yeah, bun. Go at home. Boom. Out of there. Central. SB1, please. Lieutenant Nestor about to get a complaint. 100 percent That is the most unprofessional thing I've ever seen in my life. Hey. So wait a minute. Oh, don't yell it. Don't start yelling. Hey, come on, come on, come on. All right, I'm gonna file a complaint. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Good. How are you? you tell y'all have directives. I have directives. Sheriff says ain't nobody coming in. Only five at a time. S O N G S P has priority. So G S uh, S O has priority even though. And G S P. Then you guys. I mean, this is beyond my control. I don't have any control, so don't yell at me. All right. All right. As soon as that last one gets cleared, I'm going to bring in five. Hey, yeah, unless another SO unit shows I don't, up. This is not my decision. Because I'm, I'm about to have a stroke. This is a failure of justice. And the jail does not like us, so we have five people sitting here outside waiting. That's wonderful. The sheriff is very pissed with us, okay? And he runs the jail, so. While on the phone, Columbus officer Colby Saunders reiterates that he and his fellow officers are not being allowed to process inmates because Sheriff Countryman is angry with their department. The administrative authority over jails varies dramatically from state to state, and depends largely on where the jail is located and how it was funded. In Georgia, counties and municipalities can form regional jail authorities, which share the administrative authority and financial burden of operating and maintaining a jail. Under Section 42-4-93, of the Georgia Code, quote, Municipalities located in more than one county may participate in municipal regional jail authorities in each county in which the municipality is located. This code is designed to accommodate large metropolitan areas which may require more inmate space than average sized cities or towns and fall within the jurisdiction of multiple counties. However, Section 42-4-104 of the Georgia Code clarifies that, quote, Notwithstanding anything contained in this article, no participant county or participant municipality shall be prohibited from establishing and maintaining any jail or jail holding facility. This means that jails are not required to be operated jointly by the surrounding counties or municipalities, and one city or county can have exclusive control over their respective jail facility. However, in 1970, the city of Columbus and the county of Muskogee created a consolidated government body under Section 1-100 of the Columbus Code of Ordinances, meaning that the city and the county combined their governments into one functioning body. Section 8-100 further clarifies that the sheriff of Muskogee County, quote, shall be the sheriff of the consolidated government. Although the Muskogee County Jail's website states that it was, quote, funded by revenue bonds, the consolidated nature of the local Columbus government seems to indicate that 
sheriff countrymen may not possess exclusive administrative authority over the jail, which brings into question whether he actually retained the authority to dictate which order suspects were to be booked into the jail. Once Deputy Atkins finishes booking his inmate, he attempts to return to his vehicle and exit the jail, but the bay door of the jail's hangar is blocked by a CPD patrol car. Deputy Atkins asks the CPD officers to move their car, but Columbus Sergeant Vincent Lockhart Jr. orders them not to. Them, them supervisors can I understand. Fix I get. I so get that. So I can get the out the way. All right. So, so I got a call to go to. I can't go to the car because y'all want to play stupid childish game. And ain't not. No, it ain't because of me, man. I got nothing to do with that. So I got nothing to do with that. It ain't my call. It's between the sheriff and the guy that works over there. It ain't got nothing to do with me. Move the car, or I'm gonna move myself. How you gonna move it? Move it. Move the car, man. Move the car. Why? Huh? He's in the park. Y'all acting like a bunch of damn kids, man. You need to get somebody to get in the car so I can get out. They want to play games. Y'all ain't letting them in, so they don't want to let me the out. Man, I hope I don't see you get your ass on the street because I'm gonna drive the car and you can tell your. The altercation continues inside the jail bay, where Deputy Atkins tells the Columbus officers that he will, quote, drive on by if he sees them in danger while on duty. We will discuss the legality of the Columbus officers blocking in the Muskogee deputy in a moment, but it should be noted that Deputy Atkins would not be under any legal obligation to aid the Columbus officers in a dangerous situation, or anyone else, for that matter. In the 1989 Supreme Court case of DeShaney v. Winnebago City DSS, the court held that, quote, the affirmative duty to protect arises not from the state's knowledge of the individual's predicament or from its expressions of intent to help him, but from the limitations which it has imposed on his freedom to act on his own behalf through imprisonment, institutionalization, or other similar restraint of personal liberty, which essentially means that the government, including police officers, is only obligated to protect citizens who are in their custody. And unless a citizen has been restrained in some way by a government official, then police officers are well within their authority to refuse to help or protect them. Several modern cases have reaffirmed the court's perspective on this matter, including a recent ruling by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, which concluded that police could not be held liable for failing to protect students in the 2018 shooting that claimed 17 lives at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Considering the legal precedent surrounding Deputy Atkins' threat, it is entirely possible that he would not be punished for allowing another officer or a citizen to be harmed in his presence. Yeah. I don't know, but I'm, I'm probably going to quit. This is this is so stupid, dude. Back it up so we don't have to bring his ass. It's over here. Listen, man, I'm only doing what my supervisor told me. I understand. I, this is ridiculous, and I and I hate that I'm dealing with it. But so, you're going to have to talk to the sergeant over there. I'll be talking to the chief. Hey, chief, I'm sorry. We got a situation over here. We got CPD won't let our guys out. And they're about to give go to blows. I'm asking your CPD officer to back Word. up his car. And this is, he's saying that his supervisor told him not to let it. And again, no one, no one on so our side is threatening. A, we're having a tit for tat yeah. over here. Hold on, hold on. Roll down your window. Here you go. Talk to chief. Uh, we gotta stop playing these guys. This is. This is. Yes. I know most of us are kind of at a standstill. Do I have anybody on Forest Road reference to 7511? Hey, Sarge, we got it. Uh, hey, we're all standing on the wall at the jail. How you doing that? Who is here? Hey, move your car, bro. Fantastic. All right, well, I don't get who, who your sergeant is. He, hey, he's with the chief. Okay. Sarge, Sarge, he's with the chief. He's with the chief. Hey, Fairbanks, no. You stay right there, man. Hey, oh, oh sorry. Sorry. Now your sergeant over here tell him not to move. Okay, so the, uh, I don't want to fight. Everybody in. Everybody in. 
um, I try to get through, and they immediately halfway open it, shut it on me. And I hear through the there's a deputy sentence behind the radio that female officer is trying to get get into the door. Do not let her in that door. Do not let any officer through that door. From PD. From from the jailer. The jailer is just saying that through their radio. So they won't even let us through the door. There is one person inside there, and now they let the sheriff. They book the sheriff guys out now in. He's like screaming at us to move our vehicles. They won't even let any of our guys in. They won't book any of our guys. They won't even let us in to use the bathroom. Nothing. Nothing. This is the. I think this is where. This is it. This like, is this, this is, is this is as bad as it can get. Like we can't principal someone's crime, man. This yeah. yeah this is as bad as it's. It's pretty bad, dude. Because that, this is really. That deputy was about. He was saying, "I'm about to arrest you for obstruction." Yeah. To me. Yeah. This guy's got a call. But then my sergeant's telling me not to move. Right. I have this and then when I started back and uh, he told me to stop the gas tank. <laughs> okay. What about arresting the rest of all of them for not doing their job? Alright. Okay. This is crazy. Embarrassing. Yeah. I really wish this was not my car right there, dude. I'm gonna leave the keys in there, dude. I, I really not wanting to to be a part of a to get charged with a crime, dude, for a stand, dude. I'm telling you right now, bro. Corporal Fairbanks reveals that Deputy Atkins threatened to arrest him for obstruction if he didn't move his patrol car, and tells the other officers that he doesn't want to be involved in the altercation or risk being arrested. Under Section 16-10-24 of the Georgia Code, a person who, quote, knowingly and willfully obstructs or hinders any law enforcement officer in the lawful discharge of his or her official duties shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. In the 2005 case of Golden v. State, the Georgia Court of Appeals held that, quote, verbal exchanges which can convey no threat of force or violence, but which otherwise obstruct or hinder a law enforcement officer in the lawful discharge of his official duties can authorize a conviction for misdemeanor obstruction, and that even minor actions such as arguing, running away, and lying are all examples of conduct that could constitute obstruction. It seems clear that preventing a member of law enforcement from returning to duty by blocking in their patrol vehicle would certainly constitute a violation of Georgia's obstruction code. As discussed many times on ATA, members of law enforcement are subject to the very same laws as average citizens, and it is possible that a court could conclude that Deputy Atkins was within his authority to arrest Corporal Fairbanks for refusing to move his patrol car. Eventually, Columbus Police Captain Greg Touchberry arrived on the scene in an attempt to de-escalate the situation. Uh, possession Schedule 2, Obstruction, and Regulated Objects. So far, it's all felt. Alright. Get in your car before you pick outside. Get in your car before you're prisoner out the fence. Just let her go home. Right, man. Court date and let me go to court. All CPD prisoners at the jail. Just see me out there on the... In between the street, between the building, the SO, and the CPD. We'll have our meeting there. Let's have a seat. Watch your head, okay? This is sad, man. They doing this legs, okay? The Columbus officers left the jail and attended an impromptu meeting with Captain Touchberry where they decided to release all their detainees with a court summons, despite them all having felony charges. At one point during the interaction, the Columbus PD dispatch can be heard calling for a unit to respond to a burglary in progress, but an officer replies that they're all on the wall, meaning that they are stuck at the jail with their detainees. Following the incident, Sheriff Countryman met with Columbus Police Chief Freddie Blackman, Mayor Skip Henderson, City Manager Isaiah Hughley, and City Attorney Clifton Fay who the Ledger Inquirer reported as agreeing that the jail needs to be involved in planning future crime suppression operations. It was also reported that both Chief Blackman and Sheriff Countryman have said that they believe conflicts between the two agencies have been exaggerated, and that what happened that weekend has not affected their working relationship. Overall, both the Columbus officers and the Muskogee deputies get a C- for failing to establish adequate communication between their departments, neglecting to consider the implications their actions may have on the safety of the general public, and for engaging in a petty, unprofessional, and nearly physical altercation. It is difficult to point to any one officer or deputy's actions as the primary culprit for how this interaction unfolded, and there is an argument to be made that this encounter occurred as a result of poor leadership within both respective
respective departments. It is clear that many of the officers and deputies involved felt as though they were caught in the collateral damage of an upper management battle that they didn't want to be a part of. This was particularly true for Corporal Fairbanks, who was both ordered to block the jail exit and threatened to be arrested if he did so. The true onus of the ignored 911 call can be placed on Sheriff Countryman and Chief Blackman, and their failure to coordinate or effectively communicate. This interaction showcases how poor leadership can materialize into real-world breakdowns of communication and relatively disastrous consequences for both the departments involved and the communities they serve. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even more police interaction content.